Hi and welcome back to my channel, today we're gonna talk about JavaScript performance and the Node.js event loop. To be a little bit more precise, we'll talk about JavaScript's asynchronous capabilities and what it means to be a single threaded language. So let's get started. This is a super basic React application that I'm developing for a later video uh, where we'll discuss stuff about MongoDB performance. But while I was developing it, I actually noticed a quite interesting pattern here that perhaps is not clear to everyone why it is so. So I just decided to record a separate video for us to discuss it. So what this application does is just allows you to send a bunch of concurrent requests to a local server. I can just show you my, my Docker Compose file here. There is a front end, that's that application. There is a server running, and then there is an instance of uh, the Mongo database. And this allows you to send a bunch of concurrent requests with uh, different options here to see um, how they perform on the server, so how quickly they, they are resolved. So let's say that I spawn here 30 concurrent requests and as you can see here they get start being resolved and once I expand this I actually get the individual times per request. Now if you are the unlucky clients to send this last request here you have to wait roughly um, five seconds before you get your answer and then here we are talking about a small number of concurrent requests and super simple requests so I'm just doing a couple of that, uh, very straightforward database queries and no fancy calculations nor anything, which means that's a quite reasonable value. But um, what, why is it so? Like, why does the response time actually grows linearly despite JavaScript's asynchronous nature? Despite the fact that we are sending database calls which are asynchronous in JavaScript, wh why is it so that um, the response time is actually quite predictable depending on the number of concurrent requests that I sent to the server. And what if I actually had to, for example, send five requests one after the other to get all the data that I need so that I can work with my whatever mobile application or website or, or whatever application you're using. What if each of these requests actually took five seconds to resolve? Then I need 30 seconds to actually build the final view that I'm showing to, to, to my users. And that's exactly what I want to discuss with you in this video. So the first thing that I want to talk about is about the myth of asynchronous code, right? So we say that JavaScript is asynchronous and um, or at least that it has asynchronous capabilities. It's not asynchronous by default, but you can call and you can execute code asynchronously. So what does being asynchronous mean? Well, um, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but just one thing that I want to highlight is still that JavaScript, so the fact that it's asynchronous or that it has asynchronous capabilities does not make JavaScript multi-threaded. Okay, so JavaScript is still single threaded. You have a JavaScript process running. And if that process is busy with expensive calculations, then every single other operation that would like to use that process will have to wait. And that's also the case for servers. A server is nothing more than a JavaScript application, right? So you have a JavaScript application there, which is listening for uh, requests. Once it receives the request, it processes it and it sends the response. Now, if multiple requests come at the same time, so it's maybe we could actually start drawing a bit here. So we have a little server and then here you can imagine a little server is just, um, yeah, we could call it, let's say, Let's just put a division here and then there is a little door where requests can enter and then requests start piling up, right? So here that's the entrance door and that's my request number one, request number two and request number three. And they're all parallel requests. So they arrive at the same time. Now, our server uh, is not really efficient. It has only one person here processing the requests, right? So that is our uh, guy who is processing the requests and then it accepts only one 
request to enter here. So this request is going to disappear from here and it's going to be here now. And now this guy is processing the request. It's processing and the request is waiting. And once the request gets the response or gets the data it needs, and then we say, okay, you can go, you have the data that you need, then the request is going to go outside here of our server. And then the next request is going to come in. Synchronous execution. Okay, maybe now it makes sense that we differentiate between asynchronous and synchronous execution. So synchronous execution is going to have this guy here busy as long as the request or as long as the code is being executed. So the whole code is executed by this little teller here. I think it's a teller. I don't know. But uh, service guy, or whatever, who is processing the code. Uh, he's going to do everything. Okay, and the request is going to be waiting here. And these ones will also be waiting here because the guy is busy. So the, the, the process, the JavaScript process is busy. Now, asynchronous code, just change the color here. Asynchronous code is going to be something like this. Okay, look, um, yeah, this guy's going to say, okay, thank you. I got what you, I understand what you need. Um, I cannot provide you because, well, maybe it comes from database or something, but I'm going to ask them. Okay. So now this guy is going to go to another guy here who is the database guy. And the database guy will actually fetch the data that this request here is asking for. So now the service guy is going to tell the request, okay, wait, um, go to that waiting room. And there is a waiting room here. Okay, so there is a waiting room here. And this waiting room, uh, sit there, sit on this little chair and wait until I will get back the response from the database guy. Uh, and then I'll continue with your request. Okay, so basically what it does is it frees itself from processing um, or from, from dedicating its processing power to this request and sends it to the waiting room. And it waits until this database guy finishes its request or finishes its process, finishes its whatever query or whatever we are doing in the database. So once this little service guy frees itself up, then it can actually pick up the second request. So now the second request comes here and it can start handling the second request. But then, oh, there is again another database call for this for the second request. So what it does, it's actually, okay, look, database guy, there is another one here that I need you to take care of. Um, and you also go to the waiting room. You go to the waiting room and you sit on a little chair and let's wait for the database guy. Now the database guy is processing the first the, the first request, right? The first um, um, process that it asks for some information. So once this service guy ends the, the processing of the first process, well, kind of redundant, it will send the response back to our main JavaScript process via what is called a callback. A uh, callback kind of or a promise or uh, the resolving a promise and calling its um, then method or something. Uh, but anyway, the idea is that it's going to execute, it's going to add the callback. So as the callback, right? You, I know I'm using a little uh, kind of technical terms with non-technical terms, whatever, but hopefully the idea is clear. Uh, it's going to add this function to the callback queue. And then the service is going to say, okay, wait, hold on a second. I'm busy um, um, dealing with the third request. I'm going to execute this callback. I'm going to execute this code once I'm done. Um, dealing with with this request right so um once i'm free i'm going to execute the first of the callbacks so let's say that now the service guy also sent the third request to the, to the waiting room because there was some database stuff and it can finally execute the callback so it's going to take the first request from the waiting room it's going to go there and it's going to hey I got the, the files I need, I got the data I need, please come back, let's finish processing our stuff. And then it's going to be busy processing the remaining of the code from this first request. Once that is done, and only then, it's going to free up the request and say, go, return to your browser, return to whatever client sent you, and show him this beautiful data. But here there is still, of course, the second request is still in the waiting room. The third request is also in the waiting room. So. Um, the idea here is that, as you can see, this JavaScript guy cannot do a lot of stuff by itself. It cannot do more than one. Actually, it can do a lot of stuff by itself, but it cannot do more than one thing at the same time. And that's where the asynchronous nature helps because the main JavaScript process, this service guy here, can actually continue processing requests 
while it's waiting for the response from other non-JavaScript processes. I mean, maybe they are JavaScript processes, but they are not running in the main thread. Now, it can happen that, for example, the second request here is actually a very light request. It asks just for a little bit of calculation, maybe, which doesn't even involve some database queries. So the main, the, the main thread here, the main service guy, can actually resolve the second request. It can resolve the second request while it's waiting for the information from the database for the first request. Right? So this is where the asynchronous stuff can actually be helpful because if there are additional requests here on the queue which send simply a hello world or whatever to the database guy, uh, sorry, to the JavaScript guy, then they can be resolved without having to wait for the first or for the previous requests to be resolved. Awesome. So now that we understand what it means to be asynchronous and what it means to be single threaded, I think we can put a little bit more um, technical terms here, at least to draw a little bit better, more precise diagram of what is happening in this whole thing, right? So I'm just going to erase this very nice server example. Um, maybe I could do it faster. So I'm just going to fast forward. Basically, JavaScript has, okay, it has more, but I'm just going to keep it simple. It doesn't really matter for us, but um, what's interesting here is that JavaScript has what's called the stack. Right? That's, that's the stack. That's where the current uh, function is being executed. Okay, so uh, you have the current function here, and then whatever functions this current function calls, they will be added to the stack. So if the function calls another function, it will be added here. That function will um, finish its execution with the return statement. Once it's done, it will be uh, removed from the stack and the previous function will continue its, ex its execution where it stopped, right? And then uh, once the entire function here has, has ended um, its execution, it will just be removed from the stack and the stack is going to be empty. So apart from the stack, the JavaScript has other two things. Uh, there is also the memory stuff, but I'm going to leave that out. That's the heap. But um, here you have the callback queue, right? You have here, maybe we could call it callback queue. And it doesn't actually have two more things. It's just the memory and the callback queue. I mean, probably there are more stuff, but for us here again, callback queue, right? Um, and then outside here, I'm just going to draw in, in dotted lines. Outside here, it actually has uh, what I will call the non or the external processes, right? So the non uh, blocking process, process that do not execute in this main stack here. This could be a DB call. Oops. Uh, how do I erase it? Here. This, would, this could be a DB call, so database call or an API call to an external service or something, maybe a server call, whatever, it does not execute in the main stack, in the main thread, right? So now um, the idea here is that, well, if I have a um, process which is here on the stack, okay, I have a, a function which is here on the stack and it executes some external code, it's gonna call whatever it has to call and then it's not gonna stay in the stack, it's not gonna block the stack. It will just continue its execution and it's going to say, okay, database call. Once you're done, here is a callback. So we could call it like this db, for example, db.find. Okay. And uh, then let's, this is Mongo syntax. Let's just find all the um, objects, whatever that, that should be a collection here, db.collection.find, dot then and then it receives a value or a response. Uh, let's say that we we'll just um, console log the value, right? That's a very uh, stupid program, but you know, for debugging purposes, maybe you just want to console log the result of a query or something. Uh, so we'll say, okay, execute this. And then there is this dot then method, right? So now here, um, what this is going to do, it is it will trigger this call to the database uh, and then it will continue its execution. Okay. It's not going to block the stack. It will continue and then probably it will return here eventually at some point. Right. And then this is going to leave the stack. It's not going to stay there and JavaScript is free to process additional code. Now, once this call to the database 
is completed, then this little part here, that's called the little callback, right? That's called callback once it is resolved. Now, this is gonna be added to our callback queue. So that will be our little callback here waiting to be executed. And once the stack is empty, JavaScript is gonna take a peek. It's gonna look, right? That's a beautiful eye, handsome eye. It's gonna look into the callback here. It's gonna see, okay, is there anything waiting to be processed here? Give it to me. Give me the oldest task in the callback queue. So it will then process the result of this database call. Now, if you trigger the database call and then you block the stack, then well, that's bad, right? Because the database call may be ready, but your stack is blocked by some other long running processes. So your the, the stuff is gonna stay here in the callback queue for a while before it gets processed. So it, it is also the case that if you send, for example, a little database, so a little request to the server, which just wants a little bit of information from the database. So that's the first request, just a little bit, right? A little bit. And then you send the second request, which does not, uh, which basically executes entirely in the main stack. And it's a, it's a very expensive calculation and it blocks the stack, right? Blocks the stack, blocks the stack for, for whatever, two minutes. Okay. And it's like super, super, uh, hard stuff. It's really it maybe has some very poor performance or even an infinite loop or whatever you break the stack. Uh, this first request here will never finish processing, right? because it will stay here in this callback queue forever. Um, if it blocks for two minutes, this first one here is gonna stay in the callback queue for two minutes until the stack is free. And that's because we executed this code asynchronously. Um, now there is one way that we can go around this and actually a couple of ways, right? But I think I'm gonna um, discuss these things in a, in a future video because this one is already getting quite long and quite technical. I don't wanna to cover too many things. I actually did this mistake in the past. I covered too many stuff in the same video and it just gets boring for you. So what I just want you to understand is th this little two things here, okay? Like why exactly it is so that the time of these requests is just piling up? Well, um, they are piling up because they are doing pretty much the same thing. They are doing a call to the server, which does a call to the database uh, which then returns um, afterwards returns the response. So the flow here is this one. We have the server, we have the database. Oh, I don't know why I always, uh, okay, like this. And here we have a client, right? So here we have a client. That's the client, the server, and the database. If you want to split these things into the three layered architecture where you have the presentation, the, the, the domain, uh, domain logic or business logic and the data persistence layer, that's pretty much what we have here. Um, but then we have a client, a server and a database. And what's happening is it's very linear and a very predictable uh, sort of operation. So we get a request which uh, comes to the server and then it does a little bit on the server and goes directly to the database. Right, and every request does the same, which means that things are actually piling up at the database level, right? Because um, the server is kind of freeing itself up. So it receives the first request, sends the call to the database, and then it can start processing the second request. Uh, but the moment it sends the second request to the database, if the database is still processing the first request, uh, then it's busy and it cannot process the second request, right? So the second request has to wait until the first request is resolved so that it can be, um, it can be processed. So the problem is actually here, right? It, it, a little clock where the requests have, have to wait for a long time. Uh, but as a consequence, stuff starts hanging on the server as well. Doesn't block the main thread, but the server doesn't have anything to do because stuff is everything in the database process and the server is just waiting, uh, which means that the client is also blocked here. I mean, not ah, blocked is not the right term, but um, it's just hanging, it's waiting. As you can see here, if I trigger, let's say that I, I'm gonna trigger like now, I don't know, 100 concurrent requests instead of, instead of uh, 30, and I'll just go scroll down to the last one, and you see that the last one is just waiting. It's hanging, waiting, waiting, hanging, doing nothing. If I scroll up a little bit, you see that things are being resolved in a very, very, very linear fashion, like super linear fashion, All right? So that's exactly 
what's happening here. And I think I've talked too much. Um, I think that's enough. Hope that's clear. If there are doubts, just write me down in the comments. I'm happy to answer. Thank you and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.